Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's really great to be back in Michigan. I spent the better part of a decade uh, down the road in Ann Arbor at the, the University of Michigan. And it's also really great to be here today at this DARPA ERI event. I've really been enjoying all the talks, uh, have been learning quite a bit. Um, ERI is a very important program for the country, and, and Intel is uh, fully supportive of, of uh, the goals of, of the, uh, the program and the initiative. Um, I represent Intel Labs, Intel's research organization, and what I'd like to do for the time I have today is talk a little bit about uh, our approach to innovation. How do we go about uh, invention? And I'll start by just framing things, but uh, I'll try to move through this a little quickly because a lot of these themes uh, have come through in the earlier presentations. First of all, yes, uh, the world of data is exploding. Uh, even more importantly, though, than the volume of data that's entering the world is that its nature is changing as well. Uh, much of the new data that's entering the world is coming through sensor technologies. We're blanketing the planet with new sensors. As we heard earlier today, we're also uh, populating space with sensors as well. And, and these, this sensor data uh, has new requirements in terms of the ability to process in real time. Oftentimes, the sensor data needs to be processed close to the edge in energy-constrained environments. So there's these new requirements. But there's same, at the same time, there may be uh, lessened requirements in the sense that uh, full numeric precision may not be required because the data itself may not be uh, uh, you know, requiring something like 64-bit full numeric precision. At the same time, we're seeing an evolution of Moore's Law. At last year's ERI, Intel's CTO, Mike Mayberry, gave Intel's view of the path forward for Moore's Law. And to be clear, we think that it has a bright future. Uh, the same economic drivers that have always been there continue to be present. It's just that the way that we make progress moving forward is going to look different than it has in the past. And I think Mark Rosker's talk uh, at the beginning, talking about the fourth wave of innovation, was a nice capture of, of the path forward here. But we're going to be making progress through uh, chiplet integration of heterogeneous uh, systems. We're going to be making progress through process technology improvements in the third dimension with new device functions. And of course, we need to rethink architectures in the presence of the new requirements of data, as I described earlier. So the question isn't so much, will Moore's Law continue, but rather, how can we deal with the complexity that it affords? We've heard uh, in a number of presentations about how it's getting ever more expensive to build SOCs. That's one way that complexity manifests with the progression of Moore's Law. But it also manifests in other ways in the, uh, the programming complexity of new platforms as, as we put them out in the system, uh, out in the ecosystem. Intel certainly encounters this uh, kind of problem frequently. We'll, we'll deliver server hardware that uh, initially doesn't deliver the full promise that we believe is, it's inherently capable of because we have to put ninja programmers, you know, really expert programs on the hardware in order to extract the full performance. And, and that's not an ideal scenario. We need to be able to tackle that. So all of this is to say that tackling these challenges really requires a systems perspective. And it requires a systems perspective that involves collaboration across uh, different technical experts and different domains of expertise. So I lead Intel Labs, Intel's research organization, and really we're set up, our charter is to uh, in investigate these issues and also be Intel's face externally to university uh, relationships and, and with, uh, we also engage uh, government agencies as well as peer research labs uh, in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the industry and in, uh, in our collaborators in, in the ecosystem. The way we think about innovation is sort of depicted here. It's a process of, uh, uh, that, that really begins with setting a bold goal. Part of why we really uh, like working with DARPA is that DARPA's excellent, has a long tradition of setting ambitious goals, where the, the answer, the solution might not be apparent at the beginning, but selecting the right and relevant goals is really key. We certainly invest in university research, but we don't just fire and forget. We have a lot of researchers in the labs that work side by side with university researchers, oftentimes co-authoring papers. We really want to uh, get our hands dirty and get in there and do the research in partnership with universities. And we also pursue a methodology not just of funding with dollars, but by enabling with technologies. So when we develop prototype technologies, we put them in the hands of the research community. And really what we're trying to do is nurture these communities of researchers so that we can uh, make forward progress. 
Of course, at the end of the cycle, we want to figure out ways of harvesting the results of the research uh, to capture the value. We want to capture it for our own business, but we're oftentimes very satisfied in investing in startups so that they can, uh, they can succeed. And, and uh, if they're adjacencies to our business that make sense, we're, we're certainly fully supportive of that. So this is all well and good, but it's also kind of abstract. And uh, let, let's take a look at an example to be a little bit more specific about this. So I'm going to draw an example from our work in neuromorphic computing. Neuromorphic is not a new idea. Carver Mead proposed it back in the 80s. Uh, and certainly DARPA has been a leader in this area with, with Synapse. I think it's fair to say that neuromorphic hasn't taken off yet in a significant way. But we believe that uh, it's kind of poised for some breakthroughs. A lot has been learned in the past. And so let me walk you through this. Uh, first of all, the bold goal here is we want to get orders of magnitude improvement in energy efficiency. And that would be an absurd statement to make if we were, say, using traditional methods of uh, uh, von Neumann-style compute architectures. Uh, we really are, are counting on the fact that there are existence proofs of, of the efficiency of biological brains. And there's reason for hope. We've all seen the, the progress that's been made recently in deep learning methods, uh, which use sort of a simplified model of neural networks, artificial neural networks like DNNs and CNNs. And the story in recent years has been that this, these methods didn't work for quite some time until we were able to deal with much larger data sets and get really good at the, the basic math behind these, uh, dense matrix computations, dialing in the right amount of arithmetic precision. And now we're seeing wonderful things happening with, with deep learning. And yet deep learning uh, still falls short of representing the kind of dynamics that we see in biological brains. In particular, the, the temporal dynamics are, are, are an important aspect. And so just to, to illustrate this, uh, in neuromorphic architectures, there's a notion of spiking messages uh, that carry information over time. We're trying to build systems that model uh, heavily interconnected collections of neurons, each of which consider the inputs, these spiking messages, uh, consider them, them both in time as well as in number in order to determine whether or not to generate spiking messages into the network for other neurons to, to receive. And the timing is important uh, because depending on the arrival of, of spikes, you can either excite a neuron or you can inhibit it. So really we're talking up here about building uh, an event-driven system that is very efficient and, and exhibits uh, uh, these, these uh, properties of biological brains, but in an energy efficient manner. So we've built this. Uh, Loihi is the name of the chip that we released a couple of years ago into the research community. It supports 128 cores where each core is able to simulate uh, a larger number of logical neurons on the order of 1,000 neurons. And there's an on-die fabric that's able to uh, efficiently uh, distribute spiking messages between the different neuromorphic cores. And this is also built to scale, so we can build larger systems by aggregating many uh, Loihi cores or Loihi chips together. A key characteristic of this architecture is we believe that we've learned from past attempts to build neuromorphic architectures, and we believe we have a very expressive way of defining the, the behaviors and characteristics of the logical neurons that the system supports. So what's an example problem that we could solve with, with this kind of a system? Uh, let's take a look at sparse coding, which is the task of uh, starting with a, a dictionary of features and a source image that you want to reconstruct with a sort of a minimal number of those, those features. A way to set this up on a neuromorphic architecture is each of the features in the dictionary can be represented by a neuron in the network. And then the neurons are interconnected in a way that essentially has them competing against one another. So if a particular feature contributes well to the reconstruction of the image, it'll fire quickly and send inhibiting messages to the other neurons. And uh, those other neurons then um, will fall out of, out of uh, consideration as, as the uh, simulation proceeds. So that's kind of the high level intuition of how this works. This animation just kind of illustrates it. What you see on the right hand side of the figure is the various neurons in the, the network that are firing over time. And you can see this intense activity early on where uh, there's a lot of competition and then the, the best contributing neurons uh, win out, and then the activity of the network uh, dies down quite quickly, and that's where you get into an energy efficient state. So another way to look at this is that 
for uh, this particular application, we're able to come up with a very good solution in a pretty short amount of time compared to a more traditional implementation of the algorithm, like with the, the lasso algorithm. And it nets out to being, in fact, several orders of magnitude improvement in, in energy efficiency for this particular task. Now we think that there are other applications that are promising for this kind of an architecture. We are looking at networks that have been trained through deep learning methods and automatically converting them into spiking neural networks that can do classification problems in a more energy efficient manner. There's other optimization problems of interest, graph search, path planning, constraint satisfaction. And we're also looking at ways of, of implementing dynamic control systems, uh, for example, for applications in robotics. As I mentioned earlier, we're, this system, or this architecture is built to scale and we, over time, have built ever larger systems. You can see the progression on the slide here. Today, we're actually announcing and releasing um, into the research community soon, Pohoiki Beach, which is a, a system of Loihis that uh, combines 64 chips together, and this is the largest system we've been able to build, but it's not the last. We're gonna continue building this out over time. Because a very important aspect of our methodology here is that we want to enable the neuromorphic research community. Um, if there's maybe one observation about past stalled efforts here is that there wasn't a good enough platform to, that was engaging enough and capable enough to really harness the energy of the research ecosystem. And we think that we've got, um, we've seen very good progress in the community. We've had uh, several workshops over the past couple of years and a real pipeline of publications is starting to come out of, out of this community enabled by the, the Loihi research platform. And so uh, we're very optimistic about the new learnings that, that can come from this. Now, Loihi and our work in neuromorphic doesn't work all the way around that innovation cycle because we, we haven't gotten to a point yet where we can harvest the value and, and turn it into product. It's still uh, an architecture in search of, of the best kinds of problems that it could solve. So I'd like to give another example of, of some work we've supported coming out of the University of Michigan. So this is the work of, of uh, Professor David Blau and uh, this research team was inspired by Bell's Law. Gordon Bell you know, formulated this years ago uh, to capture the notion that it seems like every 10 years we see a new class of computing platform, with the most recent one being smartphone phone platforms. And what the Michigan team has demonstrated is, is uh, the logical progression of this. Can we build truly miniature computing devices. And you want to take a note of the scale of this picture. This is a, this micro moat is millimeter scale. It's, it is in fact sitting on the edge of a, of a coin. And, uh, and despite its small dimensions, it has an energy source, it's a compute engine, it has a wireless capability, and it, and it has different sensors that you can uh, attach to it. And so uh, this is a very exciting uh, capability. Uh, we can imagine many different applications in high value asset tracking and so on. Um, so aside from seeing the praises of this research, which Intel really likes, I, I wanted to, to talk about an, just another way that Intel is trying to support this kind of research. We've supported it in the past with research grants and, and support through the SRC, uh, but there was a point in time when uh, the, the, the principals were interested in starting a company. And so uh, this is another way that Intel uh, desires to, to advance the technology of the overall ecosystem. We have Intel Capital, who's willing to step in with seed funding. We've done a number of these startup pathfinding investments over the years with different academic uh, teams that, that we've supported through other means in their early stages. And we also try to go beyond just the uh, capital investment to enabling them with new technologies. And so in this case, there's packaging technologies that we've helped to, to deliver to, to allow CubeWorks to succeed. All right, I'm near the end of my time here, and so I just wanna say a few last words about uh, how optimistic we are about our engagements with, with DARPA. Uh, there's a number of programs where we're performers, uh, Hive, Chips, IDEA. These are all um, nicely formed uh, proposals. They're, they really meet the spirit of setting bold, ambitious goals, the kinds of things that, that we want to be contributing to over time. Uh, Intel is also open to uh, helping the community in other ways. We uh, we announced recently uh, new support for MOSIS to, to provide access to our, our 22 nanometer low power process technology. And we'd like to you know, consider things like this in, in the future uh, as well. And, and 
With that, I'm just going to conclude with a quote from one of our founders and say that uh, I really hope that we can all work together and do something wonderful.